people in church tonight that needed to be saved. It's good to see a lot of you I haven't seen all week. And uh, I would have liked to have seen others tonight. Praise God. But if we keep praying and fasting, God's going to do something. Hallelujah. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them under chains and darkness to be reserved under judgment. And he spared not the old world, but he saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, and condemned them with an overthrowing, making them an example unto those that afterwards should live ungodly. Praise God. Praise God. Sometimes we don't pay any attention to these verses of scriptures in the Bible, but they're there. I want us to turn to the book of St. John 8 and 30. One of the saddest verses that is written in the entire Bible. Praise God. I've wrote it down wrong. Mm. Well, I'll just quote it then tonight. It was Judas afterwards rising up from the table and he went out the door from the supper table with the Lord and the scripture says, and it was night. And I want to preach tonight on this thought, the loneliness of sin. On the loneliness of sin tonight. Let us call upon the name of the Lord tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. When I first started out tonight on the scriptures, I found that the Bible said that the angels, when they sinned, they were cast down out of heaven. <laughs> and I sometimes wonder what we believe tonight about being in sin. Praise God. Sometimes we feel like we have it made. But when I get to thinking about the angels being cast out of heaven and that God didn't even spare the angels they were already there. They already had it made, if you please. But he cast them down out. And Lot, he didn't save Lot's situation, if you please. But Lot found himself in a bad shape and God took that bunch of people and overthrowed the whole city of Sodom and Gomorrah and destroyed them. We're living in a day and an hour now that, that people feel like 
If everybody else believes it's all right, it's all right. Whatever society says, that's the standard. However society feels about this, it's okay. If they feel like this is okay and it's not a sin anymore, then it's okay and it's not a sin anymore. But And that feeling come to us in the late 60s and the early 70s. Folks started calling it the new morality. Was none other than in morality. Begin to teach people it was all right to shack up with each other and not be married. It was all right to commit adultery and fornication because that was just a natural feeling. It was all right to be a homosexual because uh, you had to have some kind of natural affections which the Bible calls unnatural affections. They never got concerned about it at all. Fact is, they were out there having quite a party about it until a little three-letter word jumped up called AIDS. I heard a woman call in this week and she was astounded to find out after 16 years of marriage her husband was a male prostitute and he had gonorrhea, syphilis, and clap, all three of them. You can tell me his days are numbered. I've done been in the military. I know what's going on. Amen. I'm telling you, he, he's... In fact is, there is a strain of Asian gonorrhea now that has entered into this nation from Asia that is totally incurable. They don't even know what to do with it. Amen. And yet... We're a nation tonight that is a nation of talk shows. We have forsaken the fountains of living waters. And we've hewed us out cisterns that can't hold any water. These cisterns are filled with poison. They're not going to church tonight to hear a preacher like this, they're calling in on the talk show on the radio to find out how to soothe their conscience, how to somehow or another take care of this emptiness inside of me, how to take care of this lonely feeling I have but I'm all by myself. Hallelujah. But there's something that God created into each and every man. I don't know how to explain it, and I can't tell you how it happens, but God put a conscience in us. And inside of our conscience, we know it's a sin. Inside of our conscience, we know it's wrong. Inside of our conscience, we know we're not getting by with it. I've never heard of them operating on the conscience. Amen. 
You can brag about brain surgery all you want to. You can brag about heart surgery all you want to. And I don't know what all other kinds of surgeries you're going to get involved with, but nowhere did they ever find the conscience. Nowhere have they ever found the soul. There's something God breathed into a man. I know where the soul of God is. Hallelujah. And you can operate all over that body. You're not ever going to find that soul. I found it a long time ago because it said when God breathed into man, he became a living soul. And it said when man died, that spirit went back to God that breathed it in there. It's your breath, honey. It's the breath of life. It's the soul that God gave you that's going to return back to God. You can operate all you want to. You can't get away from it or get. I don't know where the conscience is, but I know somewhere it's there. You can sear it, but it'll still come back. You can put it out of your mind. I'm going to talk to people on the talk show. I'm going to play jute and jive music and pop pills and shoot up. But you can't get away from that conscience, honey. There's a day you got to sober up. There's a day you got to look in the mirror to comb your hair. Amen. You just plain got to face up to who you are. And it just simply don't make no difference whether you've been saved, never been saved, or what. Sometime in life, God's coming to you. Hallelujah. I picked up my Bible and I began to read in the book of Genesis tonight. And when God created Adam and Eve, they had two little twin boys. One of them's name was Abel and the other one's name was Cain. They grew up and there's folks that will make all kinds of excuses for Cain. But I'm going to tell you something tonight. The Bible said thou art inexcusable, O man. God never made a man on this world and God never made a woman on this world but what he didn't provide a way of salvation for him. Hallelujah. I don't care if they murdered somebody. I don't care if that woman's of the lowest, ill-reputed person in the world. God made a way that she might be saved. Hallelujah. Praise God. The reason why I know I've seen God do it, praise God. Hardest thing in the world for me to ever understand how God saved a homosexual, but I have seen a few, very few. Fact is, I know one ex-homosexual that's married to a good boy in Denver. She was a lesbian. She's not been a lesbian for 20-some years. She's been a good wife. Hallelujah. I know one thing, God can save them. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I ain't seen lots of them saved, but I've seen some of them saved. Some of them had said, I'm getting out of this hole. Some of them, they made a reference uh, to where they was, but they said, I ain't no more. Praise God. I've got a conscience to live with, and I don't want to live like that. Praise God. But old Cain, he, he, him and God was having trouble. Let me tell you something. You and Brother Elder can have trouble. But when you start having trouble with God, you've really got trouble. Hallelujah. Praise God. When you and God start having trouble, you're having big time trouble. Hallelujah. I, I sometimes get amazed as a minister of God that some folk think they're mad at me when in reality they're mad at God. They're mad at 
what you preached when you was under the anointing and God was speaking to them and that's what they're mad about. You don't just have the written word of God with you today. You still have the spoken word of God with you today. Praise God. Amen. And it's just as anointed as that Bible is when it's under the unction of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And there's some folk who think that they can get away from that. They don't, they don't have to pay any attention to that. They uh, this and that and the other. But I'm going to tell you tonight that, that it's a lonely place out there. Oh, Cain, he got up. God said, well, what are you mad about? Folks come to church, get mad. Hard to believe it, but saints do too. Come to church, get mad. Sinners come. Boy, you, you just might as well know sinners come, they're getting mad. <laughs> Either getting mad or getting glad. <laughs> Whew, praise God. I've had some of them stand around and look at me and say, well, you just upset me. I said, I bet I did. I don't get mad at them. I just kind of grin. And they look at me grinning thinking, well, he's not mad now. Maybe I can talk to him. <laughs> praise God. You can always talk to me. You want to. Hallelujah. I won't tell you something. They wasn't mad at me to start with. They was mad at the Word of God. They was mad at God. You see, a lot of folks try to make a way for Cain not to be saved. You know, Abel, he brought a sacrifice of blood of, of, of the animal to God. That's why God would accept uh, Abel's sacrifice and wouldn't accept Cain's sacrifice. That is not true whatsoever. Because if you will find out by studying your Bible, there is also a sacrifice of the ephah of flour. And Cain was a tiller of the ground, and he worked the wheat. All he had to do was beat that wheat in the flour and take it to God and present it right to God. And God would have accepted his sacrifice every bit as much as he accepted Cain's sacrifice. I mean Abel's sacrifice. I want to tell you something. You could present a blood sacrifice to God wrong, and he wouldn't accept that either. Hallelujah. You can take some animal you didn't care nothing about and say, I'll give this to God. But he said, you won't do that. You'll take the best one you got. Right, right. Amen. Hallelujah. I could preach on that for a while tonight, but I'm not going to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A lot of folks come to church, they give God what's left. They don't give him the first. But you can tell by looking what they're giving God too. Amen. The remnants instead of the first fruits. Praise God. God sees us. God knows us. He ain't pulling nothing on God. <laughs> he knows every bit about us, honey. He knows your address. He knows things about you tomorrow you ain't even started thinking about. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, Cain, he got mad because God wouldn't accept his sloppy sacrifice. His attitude. The condition of his heart. A lot of us never understand that our attitude and the condition of our heart is why we got the problems we have. And so... God jumped up and looked at him and said, Hey, Cain, why is your countenance fallen? You got a sad face. People worshiping God and you're not happy. Your countenance has all fell down. Hello. You don't even act like you know you're in church. Praise God. You can always tell when sinners come into the presence of God. Their face looks sad. 
There's no joy on their expressions. Amen. There's fear in them and fright in them and insecurity in them. So my children was talking to me about a certain person today. I said, you need to pray for them. They're insecure. I don't know nothing about their life, but I guarantee you if I had the individual here right now, I could get them to tell me they're insecure. Hallelujah. I don't know where they work at. I don't know what their address is, but I sit and talked with them for 30 minutes yesterday, and my heart went out to them and compassion went out to them because they're fearful and they're insecure and they don't know what's what. Praise God. Because the Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And all you got to do is listen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. God said, Cain, sin is at the door like a lion about to leap all over you. That's what that word means. Praise God. And Cain already had his heart made up. Cain already knew what he was going to do. Cain didn't care what God said over him, to him. And he said, I'm going out and see Abel. And the Bible said he talked with Abel, translated that word talk means quarreled with Abel. And he rose up and he slew Abel and killed Abel. And God came back and looked at Cain and he said, you really have done it up now. You've done it up big time. Amen. And he said, now you're cursed. And he said, when you go to work, you ain't even going to enjoy the fruit of your labors. Fact is, he said, from now on, you're going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. I'm going to tell you something. I began to look up fugitive. I already knew what fugitive was, but I just wanted to see what in the world that the dictionary had to say about it. And Webster said, it's a person that's fleeing from pursuit. I've heard preachers say, running from God. Running from God. Running from God. You can't run from God because he fills the heavens. And he fills the earth. And he fills the depths beneath the earth. Flee all oh, you want to flee. Run all oh, you want to run. But where are you going to run to? You ain't running from God. I sit one night in my study and thought about running from God. Running from God. And finally I came out into the pulpit and I preached that night running to meet God because there ain't nowhere to run from God. You can't run from God. If I make my bed in the belly of hell, he's there. If I ascend to the heights of the heavens, he's there. If I go into the dens, in the caves and the mountains, he's there. If I go to the depths of the sea, he's there. Where can I run from God? Fleeing from pursuit. You see, it's a lonely feeling out there fleeing for yourself. No, on Sunday, you got to go face the man. It's a lonely situation. It's a lonely feeling. You can't get out of it. And he said, you're going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. You're going to... I looked up and it said, wandering from place to place. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but... Somebody real close to me real close to me.
move. Came, lived where I lived for a while. Get up and move. Changed addresses about every six months, every year. Moved to other cities and changed addresses. I don't even know if they know that I know this. I rather doubt they know that I know this. But I found it out through another source. That they was trapped into the mafia. And while they was trapped into the mafia, one night, not really wanting to, one night, not really just planning on doing it, got into a scuffle into a gas station they were robbing he had a gun when he robbed the gas station the man grabbed the gun and they wrestled and wrestled and the gun went off and killed the gas station attendant this man runs 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 from his conscience Changes address. Runs and runs and runs. Scared the mafia will find him. Scared the police will find out. Scared this one will find out. Scared that one will find him. Brother, it's terrible to be afraid of God. You don't know. You need to be blessed. My God, I've spent many nights running from God. I've spent nights waking up in cold sweats, wondering if I was going to hell. I've spent nights waking up in cold sweats. My God, I lost out completely. There ain't even no hope with me. Raptures took place and I'm left behind. Running from God. Running from God. Running from God. Lonely. I think I'll just take a gun and take my life. I could do this and I could do that. And it looked like an accident and I got killed. A lot of folks are committing suicide tonight. Because they're running from God. And they think that's the way out. And just as soon as they drop dead... There he is. They didn't get away from him at all. Lonely. Living in a lonely. I can't even imagine how lonely Cain must have been. The Bible said that he was going to be a vagabond on top of being a fugitive. And I began to read. The Bible said, and, and I looked that up, vagabond, it said, a tramp. A worthless person. A person that sleeps all day and carouses drunk all night. Hiding from themselves. Hiding from themselves. Hiding from themselves. Oh my God, I used to live that horrible life. I used to live that horrible life. I'm glad tonight that the Lord picked me up and turned me around and took me out of the world and put my feet on something solid tonight. Hallelujah. I'm glad he washed me clean and made me whiter than the snow. I'm glad when I go home, I can go to sleep. And I know he loves me. I know he cares about me. I know he cares about my problems. There was a time in my life I didn't think, you know, the devil gets you out there and calls them people your friends. Some of you were sinner and got saved. God bless your merry hearts. And I was like that prodigal son. I finally woke up in the pig pen eating the hus. The hogs was eating. Looked around and finally began to notice these guys ain't my friends. I'm not a well-educated person, but for some reason I've always been able to get a job that made money. 
I'm not talking about $5 an hour. I'm talking about making money. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, back in the 60s, early 60s, bringing home three to $500 a week after taxes was taken out. You don't think that was good money back then? Check it out and see. Hallelujah. Buy all the groceries you wanted in a store for $13 and fill the whole car up for $6. And rent was $75 a month. Well, $75 if you lived in anything. You could get them for 35 and 50 shacks. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you something. You can have all the money in the world and be a lonely person. Out of touch with God. Every dollar you make turns into dust. And the only time your friends are your friends is when your pocket's jingling. And when you're broke, they don't even know who you are. We're going to have a party tonight. Yeah, we're going to have a party, man. We're going to have a party on your money. Amen. They wasn't my friends. Bring me in a bottle of booze so we get drunk and go out and blow all my hard-earned money. Amen. Wake up the next morning. Look at my little kids running around in rags. Look at my wife who needed nice clothes running around like a tattered Hindu of some kind. Amen. God says I put it in bags with holes in it. And as fast as you get it, they'll run out. Lonely. Sit there. You can't stand yourself because you can't stand the way you treat your wife and kids. And you can't stand yourself because you might make good money on the job and all the guys think you're something big, but all the people downtown think you're trash. Lonely. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Oh, I'm glad one night I found out what to do. I looked at this man. You talk about somebody's got it made. Jesus looks one day and he looks at old Judas, a sorry piece of meat. He, he wasn't even worth fooling with to start with. It's like all of us. And Jesus said, come on, follow me. And I'll make you fishers of men. And Judas gets up and begins to follow Jesus around. And my God, the next thing you know, he's healing the blind. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's causing the blind to see and the deaf to hear. Man, he's just not out there healing people of flu. I mean, people's eyes are flopping open that can't even see. And their ears are jumping open that's never heard a sound of the music one time. And lame legs are getting straightened out. And everything else is going on. And here's Judas walking around with this bunch. Yeah, I'm one of them. But Judas got excited about something more than Jesus. Judas got excited about something called money. He got excited about something called money. And money began to mean more to him than the Messiah ever did mean to him. He got to where, you know, I can't hardly do people in this city like I do you. You know, instead of calling me Pastor Elder when I roof for him, they call me Carl. And the folks downtown, they 
somehow or another my name gets out Carl. But it's the funniest thing that if you ever go in there and make a $1,000 deposit, it's Mr. Elder. It's not Carl no more. You know, everybody makes two, three, four hundred dollar deposits, but when you start putting in a big deposit, it's Mr. Elder. I just said that for one reason. That old boy carried that money bag. Him and the banker started getting a personal relationship with one another. Some of you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Let me tell you something. That banker ain't worried about what your name is or what your address is. He's excited about what you got in the bag and what you're bringing to him. That's the only reason why he knows you at all. Praise God. And Judas got to feeling better. He was a no-good-for-nothing scumbag when Jesus picked him up off of the face of the earth and said, follow me. But somehow or another, he got the money bag in his hand. And people downtown now were starting to recognize him. Mr. Judas. I'm going to tell you something tonight, folks. That world only loves you for what they can get out of you. That world only loves you for what they can use you for. And when you're gone, they're looking for your replacement. When you're used up, they've got another one to take your place. Some of you get out on them jobs and you think them jobs just have to have you and it literally astounds you and shocks you to find out they can do without you. I want you to know all along they could have done without you. Hey Amen. It was you that took the pride of getting into the place of thinking they couldn't do without you. Hey Amen. Uh, I want you to know they never did have it in their mind they could do without you. I want you to know something that you had never been that much to them. You're just something they're using to line their silver pockets. I'm going to tell you tonight, that's why you're lonely. That's why you're sitting in the condition you're in. You're giving your mind and you're giving your soul and you're giving your strength uh, to people that don't even care about you. Don't even love you. Don't even have any concern about you. You sit there. My God, what am I doing wrong? My God, what did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong? You never went wrong, honey. They never had you in mind to start with. Praise God. Hallelujah. They was just using your health and your mind for as long as they could. My God, Judas, you got it made. Look at them in there. Look at them in there, Judas. They're eating with Jesus. I love to watch these kids when we go places like we did this weekend. I think all of these young marrieds need to go to meetings like that too. Sit around and fellowship. Amen. There's some bad things going to happen to you, but that's to make you grow up. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's a whole lot of good things going to happen to you. And there's some good things happening to us preachers on this meeting. You know, it's the first time we ever went and Brother Westberg was gone. Wasn't at his own church. And you know, it turned out fantastic. Goes to prove to me one thing, that when you're really saved, God can really get in the situation. Uh, maybe us preachers got a little closer to each other in this trip than we most normally would. Praise God. Hallelujah. Opened up a few things to one another we most probably wouldn't have. I feel sorry for Brother Westberg. You need to pray for him. Them guys just dump stuff on him and dump stuff on him. And he, my God, I'd hate to be him. Praise God. Hallelujah. Somebody said something about me being superintendent. I said I used to want to be, but not no more. Hallelujah. 
said, but we got to have somebody that's fantastic and this and that and the other thing. I said, good, pray for one. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm going to enjoy my grandkids if I can. Hallelujah. I'm not just going to kill myself for a whole bunch of great lust people. Oh, my God. What are you preaching on, Brother Ella? I'm telling you, you can get into a wonderful fellowship place and not know what you got on your hands and not appreciate what you got on your hands. And the next thing you know, you're going to get yourself in serious trouble. Look at them, Judas. They're in there. They got their heads on Jesus' bosom. And he's ministering to them. Where are you at, Judas? I've got my mind on the door. I've got somebody outside. I've got to go see. But the Bible said when he went out that door that it was night. That said a whole bunch. That said a whole bunch. What do you mean, Brother Elder? That means the fellowship was cut off. The fellowship was back in there in the light. Laying on Jesus' breast is back in there in the light. Jesus ministering to you is back in there in the light. Hallelujah. Christ ministering to you about the needs is back in there in the light. Judas, you see Judas? Oh, but there's something in my hand. And, and I've made an agreement with something that doesn't love me. I made an agreement with something that after it has used me, is going to laugh at me and laugh me right out of the office. It was night. It was dark. And they got Jesus. I don't know what was in Judas's mind. I don't know whether he thought he'll get himself out of it. He always got himself out of everything else. But he ain't getting himself out, Judas. You done betrayed him. Dark out here, isn't it, Jonas? Lonely out here, isn't it, Judas? It's bad. But it ain't as bad, Judas, as it's going to be. Because you're going to see him march him away, Judas. You're going to see him beat him with a whip, Judas. You're going to see him hang him on a tree, Judas. And you're going to watch him die, Judas. And he said, I, I can't even stand this. And he ran back in there. I want to get back in the fellowship. I want to get back. Here! Take this money! You built me up. You puffed me up. You made me think I was something I wasn't. You can have this money. And he threw it on the floor. And they looked at him and grinned and said, Too late, bud. We done got out of you what we wanted. Take your blood money and take it home with you. And Judas running. Eyes filled with fear. Where are you going, Judas? I don't know. I know down at the potter's field, there's a big old tree down there with a rope in it. 
Where are you going, Judas? I got to get away from this feeling inside of me. It's driving me. It's tearing me. And as he runs to that tree, and he makes a loop in that rope, slides it around his neck and jumps out there. And the rope is so rotten it won't even hold him. And the rope breaks. He falls out into the potter's field to the broken vessels. Slices his insides out of him and they run through the broken pottery. Lonely. Lonely, 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 lonely. You don't have to live in that lonely world. You don't have to come out this way. I've watched a bunch of them in here. They was just like those running in the night. Running in the night. I know the feeling. That's the reason why I go to their homes. That's the reason why I pray over them. I know the feeling. I know the feeling. I know the feeling. I know the feeling. I know what it's like to wake up in the middle of the night and you can't feel God. I know what it's like to call upon God and He don't answer. But you don't have to live that way. He made a way for you tonight. You can come to this altar tonight. You don't have to live that lonely feeling nobody cares about you no more. You can come running to this altar tonight. You can fall in this altar tonight and be broken in this altar tonight and cry out to God, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my transgressions. Oh God, I surrender my all to you tonight. Hallelujah. I preached to two or three in here tonight. I know tonight. Oh God, tonight. I'd rather you come to this altar tonight and go home with peace in your heart and peace in your mind tonight than to go home with another lonely night. Than to go home tonight with another night on your couch so far from God. To go home tonight outside of the mercies of God. Would you come? Would this church stand and pray tonight? Would you come?